Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. We may still have some more people trickle in, we'll see. As is their want. Yeah. People will keep murmuring for a couple seconds so they realize everything they're saying will be on the internet in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so I hope you're not talking about anybody in the church. <laughs> Okay. So, when we get started in a second, after my non introduction introduction, which I've been giving for the, for the book of Psalms, when we get started, we're going to be on uh, Psalm 68, if you're looking at an Orthodox study Bible, Psalm 69, otherwise. And. My non-introduction introduction, as you're probably used to by now, is I gave a big, long, overlong, long-winded introduction to the book of Psalms, the first two Bible studies on the book of Psalms. I repeated it twice, and those are on the internet, so if you really want to hear it again, you can go back there and listen to either of the first two, and they'll give you my big, long, long-winded introduction. Um, but otherwise, because every night we're starting a different psalm, I'm not going to go back through it all again. And especially since, as is, half the time we only get through four or five psalms. We need the time. So, did anybody have any questions or anything left over from a couple weeks? It's been a couple weeks because we didn't meet last week. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started then in Psalm 68, Orthodox Study Bible, 69 otherwise. Save me, O God, for the waters flood my soul. I am stuck in the mire of the sea, and there is no place to stand. I came into the depths of the sea, and the storm overwhelmed me. I grow weary with crying, my throat is hoarse. My eyes fail me from hoping in my God. Those who hate me without a cause multiplied even more than the hairs of my head. My enemies who persecute me unjustly have become strong. Then I paid for things I did not steal. O God, you know my foolishness and my transgressions are not hidden from you. O Lord, O Lord of hosts, let not those who wait for you be put to shame because of me. O God of Israel, let not those who seek you feel ashamed because of me. For your sake I bore disgrace, humiliation covered my face. I am become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. For the zeal of your house consumed me, and the insults of those who disgraced you fell on me. Okay, I'm going to pause there for a second. Does anybody recognize in verse 10 there? Where that verse is quoted in the New Testament, I'll give you a hint. It's in one of the gospel readings. Well, it's actually it all, it's, it's an event that happens in all four gospels. Right. When when Christ goes into the temple and he finds the money changers there, and the the purpose of the money changers was the the Roman coins, the Roman imperial coins that were minted, had the image of the emperor and the images of the pagan gods stamped on them. And so you couldn't bring those into the Jewish temple. They had separate temple money that didn't have the pagan marks on it. And so if you were making a long trip, say you were going to sacrifice a goat or a sheep, or some birds, you know, if you're on a four-day walking trip from another part of the world, it's kind of hard to lug the sheep or the goat or whatever it is you're sacrificing all that way. You've got to feed it, you know, you've got to take care of it the whole trip. And so it's much easier for people to bring money and come to the temple and buy whatever it was they were going to sacrifice there. So they would have to come in, they would have to exchange their money, and then they could take that temple money to the vendors to buy to buy the animals they were going to sacrifice. Well, what Jesus discovered when he went in there is that they had set up a racket where they were manipulating the exchange rate and the prices they were charging for the animals 
so that they were making a lot of money. Both the money changers and the people selling the, the sacrifices. So that's why Jesus gets so angry and drives them out. Right? Because instead of just offering a service to God's people who are coming there to, to make sacrifices to God, they're trying to get rich. They're trying to exploit people's religion in order to, to make a profit. Okay? And so Jesus drives them all out, turns over their tables, and that happens right before the beginning of Holy Week. That happens right before the beginning of the week leading up to his crucifixion. And it is probably that incident more than any other that ended up getting him that ended up getting him killed. Yeah. In terms of the, the Jewish leaders and everything deciding they needed to, to kill him to get rid of him. And what's quoted is, at that time, it says that what's fulfilled is this verse, verse 10, for the zeal of your house consumed me. Now when we read that story, it's really easy to pass over that verse real quickly. Right? You say, oh, zeal of your house, yeah, Jesus was really zealous and he drove all the people out. And then we keep reading. Right? But as we've talked about before, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, they're not just quoting whatever verse is quoted there. They're referring you back to the whole context. Yeah. So they're not just saying, you know, yeah, Jesus was zealous. Here's a verse that talks about zeal. <laughs> they looked up at their concordance. Right. They're saying, if you want to understand what's going on here with Jesus at the beginning of Holy Week, read this psalm. Read this psalm. Okay. And with that in mind, if you go back to, for example, those who hate me without a cause are multiplied more than the hairs of my head. My enemies who persecute me unjustly have become strong, that I paid for things I did not steal. Right? All of a sudden, Christ has all these enemies. Why did they hate him and want to kill him? What had he ever done to them? Nothing. Right? And the crimes they were trying to convict him of are crimes he didn't commit. Right, things he didn't steal. And so now, as, and, and uh, for your sake I bore disgrace, humiliation covered my face. And even the second half of verse 10, the insults of those who disgraced you fell on me. And what does that second half mean? Well, that second half is important too, because that second half, what it's essentially saying is that the people who hated Jesus, and the people who were insulting Jesus and mocking Jesus, we're really hating God and mocking God and disgracing God. It wasn't just Jesus. It wasn't just like they didn't like his personality. <laughs> right? He rubbed them the wrong way. It's, it's who he was and what he represented. They hated. They hated. So now as we continue, keep, keep in mind, keep in mind that we've been told now that this is talking about this is talking about Christ. I bent down my soul with fasting and it became a disgrace for me. I also made sackcloth my garment and it became a byword to them. Those who sit at the gate were talking against me and those who drink wine were singing about me. But I, O Lord, pray with my prayer to you. It is the time of your goodwill, O God, in the abundance of your mercies. In the truth of your salvation, hear me. Save me from the mire that I may not be stuck therein. Deliver me from those who hate me and from the depths of the waters. Let not a storm of water drown me, neither let the deep swallow me up, nor the well enclose its mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for your mercy is good. According to your abundant compassion, look upon me. Turn not your face from your child, for I am afflicted. Hear me speedily. Give heed to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. For you know my disgrace and my shame and humiliation. All who afflict me are before you. My soul expected disgrace and trouble, and I waited for someone to sympathize with me, but no one was there and for comforters, but I found not one. They gave me gall for my food, and they gave me vinegar for my drink. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> From later in Holy Week, right? That verse gets quoted again when Christ is on the, the cross, and depending on the gospel, he either asks for a drink, or they decide to give him one anyway, and they go and they stick it in the gall and the vinegar, 
rather than water and give that to him to shove a sponge full of that in his face to drink. Let their table become a snare before them and a recompense and a stumbling block. Let their eyes be darkened so they may not see and bend down their backs continually. Pour out your anger upon them and let the fury of your wrath lay hold of them. Let their dwelling place be laid waste and let no one live in their tents. For they pursued closely the one you slew and they added to the pain of my wounds. Add lawlessness to their lawlessness and let them not enter into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out from the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. I am poor and suffering and the salvation of your presence, O God, lays hold of me. I will praise God's name with a song. I will magnify him in praise. And this shall be more pleasing to God than a young bull with horns and hooves. Let the poor behold this and be glad. Seek God and your soul shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God shall save Zion and the cities of Judah shall be built. And they shall dwell therein and inherit it. And the seed of his servants shall possess it. And those who love his name shall dwell in it. So there's two pieces in that last part that we wrote. The first piece... Is talking about judgment on the people, the people who are afflicting him, and then the second piece is talking about blessing for the poor and the and the suffering. And you see, they use the same terms, right? So, for example, in verse twenty-six, let their dwelling place be laid waste, and let no one live in their tents. As opposed to in verse thirty-six, for God shall save Zion, and the cities of Judah shall be built, and they shall dwell therein and inherit it. And the seed of his servants shall possess it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Now a question you might ask, if this is about Christ, didn't Christ, when he was on the cross, pray that the people who were killing him would be forgiven? Whereas this talks about judgment coming on them, and then being punished. Well, this is, I mean, we see this in a lot of Psalms, right? The same kind of theme, where there's this, this thing for judgment. Interestingly, verse 26 of this Psalm, although less well known, is also quoted in the New Testament. And it's quoted about Judas. It's quoted about Judas. Let their dwelling place be laid waste and let no one live in their tents. So, what's the difference between Judas and all the other people Christ prayed for? Because Christ didn't single out Judas. He didn't say, God forgive them, but they don't know what they do, except that bum Judas. Right? Get him. Right? He didn't say that. Right? Well, what's the difference? So we've talked about before, Judas is our exhibit A of someone who didn't repent. Actually, he's exhibit B, because we talked about Saul. <laughs> of Israel before, but who d- didn't repent. Right? Who didn't turn back and find forgiveness. He went off and killed himself. He didn't come back to God seeking that forgiveness. And that's what separates someone like Judas, the people who received this wrath, and from verse 30 on, the poor and the suffering. Right? The poor and the suffering. And we also see a glimpse in verse 32. Verse 32. One of the important things, and we don't really appreciate this because of the time we live in, but up until the time of Christianity, up until the time that the apostles decided to go out and spread the Christian religion, there were, there were no religions on earth that did not sacrifice animals as part of their worship. This is true all over the world. Animals and or people. <laughs> right? You look, at, you look at Native South American, Central American, North American civilizations. They were practicing all of the stuff. They were practicing ritual sacrifices. India, they were practicing ritual sacrifices. Egypt, the Romans, the Greeks, the Jews in their temple. Everyone was sacrificing animals. That's how you worshipped. That's how you worshipped God. Okay. Christianity comes along, and all of a sudden they don't. Okay. Instead we have the Eucharist, we have communion. Right. 
So there's this huge transition that takes place. Again, we're not used to seeing people going around killing, <laughs> doing animal sacrifice. In fact, if somebody had a religion in the U.S. that was trying to do animal sacrifices, we'd probably be grossed out and disgusted. You know, the ASPCA would come and try and shut them down and there'd be a big court case with the ACLU and everything. Because <laughs> you can't do that. You can't just go around and kill you out. But that was how you worship God for everyone in the world. For everyone in the world. And that's why the Romans, when they heard rumors about what Christians did, all right, that they're, oh, they're eating the body and blood of some guy named Joshua, right? They, they thought Christians were cannibals. They accused Christians of cannibalism because they couldn't even comprehend a religion where you weren't sacrificing something. So they said they must be sacrificing people and eating them. <laughs> right? This weird cult, these Christians. Well, in terms of understanding that, now, of course, our understanding as Christians is that, that Christ's offering of himself was the real sacrifice. And that all those Old Testament sacrifices were sort of pointing to that. And so now that we have the full reality of what Christ did for us, right, we participate in that through communion. But we don't have to go and make all these sacrifices anymore. Well, this verse and others like it, is one of the key pieces in terms of how that understanding came to be. Right? And this shall be more pleasing to God than a young bull with horns and hooves. Right? Christ's offering of himself, which is what we're talking about here in this psalm. Christ enduring the suffering that he didn't deserve, him dying and then him, him rising again. God takes more delight in that offering than he does in some animals. Than he does in some animals. In fact, we're going to see a lot as we get into the prophets about a year from now. <laughs> when we get into the prophets, we're going to see a lot of God trying to explain this to them ahead of time. He's trying to say, I'm not just into animal blood. Right? That doesn't, that's not what I'm all about. Right? The, the, these sacrifices are aimed at something. They're supposed to mean something. You're just going through the motions of killing animals isn't what it's about okay but this is this is part of the beginning the beginning of that understanding right the idea that that it's Christ's offering that pleases God and that we please God by joining in right it's Christ who first of all praises God's name with song and magnifies him in praise and we join in with him Does anybody have any questions about? Something sort of crossed my mind. Uh, the readings in the bulletin this morning, uh, uh, they talked about uh, uh, somebody who sins more than I do is, or sins against me, they are suffering more than I am, and that's how I should regard them. Uh, in the bulletin this morning, the, the spiritual quotes. Oh, okay, okay. I thought you were talking about scripture. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so when it speaks of the poor and the suffering, it doesn't necessarily mean the innocent. It means sinners who repent rather than people who are not guilty of anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't say the innocent. It says the poor and the suffering. <laughs> That's, yeah. This isn't, this isn't the innocent and the guilty. Right, it's the repentant and the unrepentant. Well, sort of as a side mark, like you said about Judas, you could also, uh, what do I want to say, you, you, you could also hold Peter up and show the difference from what Peter did on the denial of Christ, which is probably just as equally sinful as Judas right. portraying Christ. Peter did the same thing by saying, I don't know the man. And yet you can see the difference where Judas did not repent and Peter did. Right. And so that's his Yeah, and, that's, and that's, that's a crucial distinction. Right? The difference between Peter and Judas or any of the other disciples who deserted yeah. Christ. You know, that was referred to in this song, I become a stranger to my brothers. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden none of them know me. You know. Uh, that the distinction is all is not between people who are perfect and people who are sinners. The distinction is always between people who 
are repentant and people who are not repentant. Okay, so Psalm, Psalm 69, Orthodox Study Bible, 70 otherwise. O God, make haste to help me. May those who seek my soul be dishonored and shamed. May those who plot evils against me be turned back in disgrace. May those be turned back immediately who shame me, saying, Well done, well done. May all who seek you greatly rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation always say, Let God be magnified. But I am poor and needy, O God, help me. You are my helper and deliverer, O Lord, do not delay. So this is a very similar psalm, just in compact form, right? You have the same kind of ideas. This particular little short one is read in all the Compline services. So the time when you most likely would have heard a Compline service, we do great Compline on Monday at the beginning of Lent. We also do the Compline service on Friday nights in Lent before we do the Akathis we do the, the hymns of the Theotokos. So, and this is one of the psalms that's read that's read then. And so it's especially appropriate to let, again, same kind of themes, but very compact. So Psalm 70, Orthodox Study Bible, 71 otherwise. O God, in you I hope, may I never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a God for protection and a strong place for salvation. For you are my foundation and my refuge. O my God, deliver me from the hand of the sinner, from the hand of those who transgress the law and act unjustly. For you are my patience, O Lord. The Lord is my hope from my youth. By you I have been supported from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my protector. My song shall be always of you. I am become as a wonder to many, and you are my strong helper. Let my mouth be filled with your praise, that I may sing of your glory and of your magnificence all the day long. Do not abandon me in the time of old age. When my strength fails, do not forsake me. For I am my enemies speak against me, and those who watch for my soul plot together, saying, God forsook him, pursue and lay hold of him, for there is no deliverer. O God, do not stand afar off from me. O my God, give heed to help me. Let those who falsely accuse my soul be shamed and forsaken. Let those who seek evils for me be covered with shame and reproach. But I will hope continually, and I will add to all your praise. My mouth shall proclaim your righteousness, your salvation all the day, for I am not acquainted with learning. I shall enter into the power of the Lord. O Lord, I shall remember your righteousness, yours alone. You taught me, O God, from my youth, and from then until now I will proclaim your wonders. And even to old age and to my last breath, O God, do not abandon me, until I proclaim your arm to every coming generation. Yes, your mighty deeds and your righteousness. O God, I proclaim the magnificent things you did even to the highest heaven. O God, who is like you. How great and evil are the afflictions you showed me, and you returned and made me live, and you raised me up again from the depths of the earth. You multiplied your greatness, and you returned and comforted me. You brought me up again from the depths of the earth. Truly I will give thanks to you with the instrument of a psalm, O God. I will sing to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will greatly rejoice when I sing to you. Soul, my soul, which you redeemed. My tongue shall meditate on your righteousness all the, day, all the day long when those who seek evils for me are dishonored and shame. Okay, so we see these are grouped here because they have kind of, a, kind of a similar theme. Sort of the, the big clue that this is another psalm that's talking to us about Christ is verse 21, You multiplied your greatness and you returned and comforted me. You brought me up again from the depths of the earth. Right, that idea of resurrection. But when I talk about, and this is a good psalm to talk about it with, going all the way back to my actual introduction, not the non-introduction introduction, but the introduction introduction. Right, I talk about how primarily all of the psalms are talking about Christ, but that doesn't mean that's all they're about. Right, that doesn't mean just, oh, oh, okay, this is, Christ fulfilled that, and so now I can, or is that neat, this reminds me of, of Jesus. But the show, this psalm is a good, and like I said, this psalm is a good example. This psalm not only shows this pattern from Christ's life, but it shows how that same pattern can and does apply in our own lives. Right? Yours and mine. Because when this was originally written, right, this was originally written by David, David wasn't 
sitting there having a prophetic vision right, of Jesus a thousand years later and describing it. Right? He wrote this about himself. He wrote this about himself. Okay, now we see that the ultimate, the ultimate fulfillment of that comes in, in Jesus, but it's also about himself. So the same way, this is about Christ. It's about the way God redeemed Christ. It's also, or at least should be, about us. Right? Because where does it start? It starts thanking God that all the way from the beginning of our lives, from our mother's womb, he's been there guiding and protecting us. Right? And teaching us. And praying what? That that'll continue all the way to old age, all the way until our last breath. Right? So there's a flip there. It's, it starts out, God, you've taken care of me my whole life. Now looking forward, I'm going to depend on you going into the future. And just like, obviously, Christ is the greatest example of this, with his suffering and his death and his resurrection, but I think pretty much everybody here, since we're all over 20, <laughs> uh, various amounts over 20, but, you know, can, can look back at our lives and say, how great and evil are the afflictions you showed me, right? Bad things have happened. Okay. The idea that, that God has been with us our whole lives doesn't mean nothing bad's ever happened to us. Right? Bad things have happened, but you returned and made me live. Right? That when those bad things were happening, God was still with us. And he transformed those bad things into good things. And so if right now is another one of those bad times, again, we could look forward and say, and trust in him, that this is going to be turned into the good times again. He's not going to abandon us here, that he's going to return and we're going to live again. And that, of course, continues all the way through to when we face our actual death. Because we know what God did in Christ as we go and face our own death, we can face our own death with that same hope. Now, even though we're going to be lowered down into the depths of the earth that God is going to return and raise us up to live again. This is, this is what we're talking about when, when you're first baptized or when anyone's being baptized or on, on feast days when we baptize people, when we sing that verse from St. Paul, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And he says in the epistle reading we read in baptisms, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. What he's trying to get across to us is that we are now in Christ. We're Christ. And so that pattern that was true of Christ's life, that pattern that we see in the Psalms, will also be true of ours. Right? And if we've shared in his sufferings, and ultimately in his death in this life, then we could also know we're going to share in his resurrection. When it comes. So those two things go together. Those two things go together. We can read, we can pray this psalm and think about Christ, how God was faithful to him, and also think about how he's been faithful and, and trusting him to be faithful to us. But if David wrote that, then was he not asking that for himself too? Yep. As well as he was asking at he was as well speaking about what was going to happen in Christ. Yep. Yeah, he, that was, he, he was going to die. Yep. And he, okay. Yeah. And if you think about David's life that we read about in First and Second Samuel or First and Second Kingdoms, way back <laughs> a year ago, uh, you remember in his life, in his youth. He, he was doing pretty good. He was pretty close to God in his youth. When he got up into his older age, there started to be some trouble. <laughs> there started to be some problems. And so it's especially poignant here when he's praying. <laughs> yeah. You know, that he, he wants to try and finish the way he started. But he's still asking God for forgiveness, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, that God will, will return and will return everything back. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, it says to the sons of the sons of Jonadab and the first ones came. That's the context. Of that yeah. So that's sort of that. That's sort of the point when he was writing. Well, no, he was writing it. He was writing it for the sons of. There's there's two pieces there. For the sons of Joanna, now, those are singers. Oh. Right? Remember, we had the families of the singers in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. That that second part, the first one taken captive. Remember, we saw in that other prescript that talked about how they sang it on the way to Babylon. And that's what that's referring to. That this was this was sung by those who were being the first group that got deported. Saying this hymn also. Any other questions about that one? Okay. So Psalm 71, Orthodox Study Bible 72, otherwise. And this one note is for Solomon. It doesn't say by Solomon. <laughs> right? For Solomon. Meaning someone in Solomon's court wrote it, essentially. O God, give your judgments to the king and your righteousness to the king's son, that he may judge your people in righteousness and your poor with judgment. Let the mountains raise up peace for your people and the hills in righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people and shall serve the sons of the poor. He shall humble the false accuser. And he shall continue as long as the sun and before the moon from generation to generation. And he shall come down like rain on the fleece, like raindrops falling on the earth. In his days, righteousness and abundance of peace shall flourish until the moon is removed and he shall rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the inhabited earth. The Ethiopians shall bow down before him and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and their islands will come bearing gifts. The kings of Arabia and Saba will bring presents. All the kings of the earth shall worship him. All the Gentiles shall serve him. For he rescued the poor from the hand of a strong man and the needy for whom there was no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and he shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their souls from usury and injustice, and precious shall be their name in his sight. He shall live, and there shall be given him from the gold of Arabia. They shall pray continually because of him. All the day long shall they bless him. He shall be a support on the earth upon the summits of the mountains. His fruit shall be exalted more than Lebanon, and they shall flourish from the city like the grass of the earth. Let his name be blessed unto the ages. His name shall remain before the sun, and all the tribes of the earth shall be blessed in him. All the Gentiles shall bless him. Blessed is the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. And blessed is the name of his glory forever and unto ages of ages. And all the earth shall be filled with his glory. Amen, amen. And then that verse 20 is an editorial note. It's not actually part of, part of this all. But we'll get to that in a second. So, this psalm, this psalm was written for Solomon, right? So by someone in Solomon's court. Okay. So let me ask this. Was this accurate about Solomon? Not quite. <laughs> right? Did, did Solomon rule from, from sea to sea, meaning from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean? No. <laughs> right? No. He didn't. Did he ever rule from the river to the ends of the earth? No. Or from the Euphrates? No. Right? Now, he, he did have some... <laughs> That's not the there. The river is referring to the Euphrates. Um, and he didn't even have all of that. Um, now, he did have some Ethiopians bowed out before him. <laughs> so he did have, not all of them, but... but the Queen came to visit. But did Tarshish, which was later the city of Tarsus, which is where St. Paul is from, is in the, the uh, I won't draw one of my horrible maps, but it's in the, the southwest corner of what's now Turkey. Okay. So when it talks about Tarshish and her islands, that's talking about that western part of Turkey and the, what we now call the Greek islands. Right? Did they ever come and pay tribute to Solomon and but the no, no, they didn't. And uh, did they pray continually because of him? 
and bless them all the day long? Did he rule over all the Gentiles? <laughs> Did any of the Gentiles even notice him? As far as we can tell historically, no. <laughs> okay, so obviously, you know, while this was written for Solomon, probably before he was before he was ever king, probably when he was proclaimed as the heir, right? This may be a, this may be a prophecy. Well, we, we have two options. One, we could say, well, this was just a guy kind of kissing up. Right? He was trying to get in good with Solomon, so he was saying how great and wonderful he was. And all that. Right? that doesn't explain why it's in the Bible. Right? Why this would be held on to for generation after generation of people. Right? Well, I would suggest that because this is a prophecy about one of David's sons, it's just Solomon didn't turn out to be that son. Right? We know Solomon, though he was David's son, turned out to be disobedient. And because of that, he lost most of David's kingdom. And his sons didn't inherit it. They only inherited a tiny remnant. Right? So, so this is about another one of David's sons. So let's look for some other clues in terms of which one it might be about. Because your, your typical Jewish interpreter of this would just say, oh, well, this is about whoever the Messiah is going to be. Right, whoever the Messiah is going to be. Let's look at, say, verse 11. All the kings of the earth shall worship him, and all the Gentiles shall serve him. Notice there's a capital H. Right? There's a capital H in your Orthodox study Bible. Why is that a capital H? Well, why is it referring to God? Isn't it talking about the king? The last... <laughs> The last, the last six or seven verses have been talking about the king, right? It doesn't say, it doesn't say all the kings of the earth shall worship Yahweh because of him, right? It, that, that's what you, your typical Jewish interpretation of the Messiah, right? He'll become king, and he'll be such a wonderful king that all the other nations will come and worship Yahweh because of him, right? This says they're going to come and worship the king. And all the Gentiles are going to serve the king. Right? Well, God, give your judgments to the king and your righteousness to the king's son. God and Jesus. So, whoever, whoever this king is, this king is also God himself. Right? So this is a pretty clear, again, this is one of those psalms that give us this picture of the fact that that the Messiah isn't just God's son in some kind of vague sense, right? Like <laughs> the way you'd say, oh, that's a title. He's the son of God. But that the king is actually the son of God. The descendant of David they're talking about is also God himself, right? And, and Christ. And so this is, this is one of those passages when we're putting together the idea of the Trinity this is one of those passages. We have someone here who's the Messiah, who's the descendant of David, who's a man, but who's also God. Who's a, he's God and he's a person, but he's not the same person as God, his father. Two right? persons. Okay. And that's right here. And again, as we've noted in several of these Psalms, what again is the sign that the Messiah has come? people of Jesus' time, they would say the sign of the Messiah coming would be what? A free and independent Israel. Right? Get rid of the Romans. What's the sign the Messiah has come here? That all the Gentiles come to worship him. What do we see actually happen in the New Testament? In the New Testament, Christ the Messiah comes. He doesn't go around overthrowing any governments. But what happens? The worship of God and of Him, of Christ, goes out to all the Gentiles, to all the nations. Okay. So there was actually, all is a slight exaggeration, but we'll get there. When all the kings of the earth are pretty close, worship Christ at one point in history. <laughs> and there will come a time when it's true of everyone. So, 
again, we have to, those two points, number one, we see Christ here as the Messiah and as God. And then that second point, again and again in the Psalms, the sign that the Messiah has come is always that the Gentiles come to faith. Not, not that everything all of a sudden is wonderful for the Jewish people. Well, when we, for people who didn't hear the question, I asked, weren't they, according to their laws, not supposed to associate with Gentiles? Now, we read their law. It doesn't say don't associate with Gentiles. Right? It said don't live like the Gentiles live. Right? Because the purpose was, what was the purpose of their laws? What was the purpose of them obeying all these laws and doing all these things? The purpose was that they were supposed to be an example to all the other nations. So that those other nations would also come and worship Israel's God. Right? That was the goal. That was the plan. <laughs> now that gets, by the time Christ lives, right, and this is what he keeps hammering on, they've twisted what the law was all about. They've twisted it around. Right? And so now... Instead of trying to be an example to the Gentiles, the Gentiles are all unclean, which is something we, the law never says that. In fact, remember, there are all kinds of rules. If someone's an alien, a foreigner who comes to, came to live in Israel, there are all these rules about how they had to be treated. Remember? <laughs> all the kindness they had to show, all the, yeah. the way they had to treat them. They couldn't take them as slaves. They couldn't, you know, right? There were all these rules how they had to treat them. Is that how Israel was treating Gentiles at the time? <laughs> Jesus, right? No. <laughs> right? The exact opposite. Right? They, wouldn't have, they wouldn't have anything to do with it. It had gotten twisted and perverted into, into essentially what we would today call racism. Right? We're the chosen people. You people are filthy Gentile sinners. You know, it's subhuman. Which is the exact opposite of everything that, that, as we've seen all the way through here. Again, the ultimate goal is always that the Gentiles will worship God too. From Israel's example, and then when Israel becomes a bad example, right, God does it another way. But it's never about him loving Israel and hating the Gentiles. It's always about him loving the whole world and using Israel to bring salvation to the whole world. So that was, that was something that they had twisted in their own minds. And we're perfectly capable of doing that as Christians today. You know. There's, all, there's good Christian people and then there's those other people. <laughs> you know, those sinners who do this and that. And we don't associate with them. Right? We go across the street and walk, walk by on the other side of the street when we see them. Right? Because they're not like us. We're the good Christian people who love Jesus and Jesus loves us. And, right? <laughs> so we're just as capable of doing that. The whole purpose of us being Christians is to try to save them. <laughs> Right? Same way with, as it was with Israel. But we, we get full of ourselves. Does anybody else have any questions about it? In this uh, Bible, there's a verse 20. Yeah. That says... That the prayer, prayers of David... Yeah. In the, in the, yeah, I stopped right before that because that's not really part of the psalm. That's sort of an editorial note. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll go into that now, since that's the next thing. Okay, uh, she's referring to a verse, verse 20 there, the hymn, which the Orthodox Study Bible says, the hymns of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. We talked a little bit about how, in my introduction, introduction, about how this was compiled, that there's actually, what we call the Book of Psalms is actually made up of five books. Uh, and it's called five books because it's on five separate scrolls because of how long it is. And how those were arranged and how those were, were put together. There are books and books and books and books and papers and papers and papers and papers you could read on how they were put together. And it's all basically conjecture. There are places where some psalms that kind of talk about similar things we could see are kind of grouped together. 
And there's other places where <laughs> it's sort of like, well, why is this one after that one? Then? You know, we don't know. And they're not chronological because we're going to see when we get to Psalm 90, Moses wrote Psalm 90. <laughs> Moses lived a long time before David. Okay. So the way this is usually understood is that the chunk of Psalms we just read, right, the last about 50 Psalms, pretty much in the scripts have pretty much all said that they were of David, that David did them at some point. And so what this verse is signifying is that there was sort of this big chunk of psalms that David wrote. Right? And that big document, that big, all these psalms that David wrote, got incorporated into the book of Psalms. And this is where that ended. Okay. Now it doesn't mean that none of the other psalms we read are going to be from David. <laughs> but it means that that big pre-existing chunk. It's like if you took, if you were going to write a new dictionary, of the English language, right? And you said, well, I'm going to start out by taking Noah Webster's original dictionary, and then I'm going to add to it with more modern words and that kind of thing, right? So you take his whole dictionary, and then you add to it, and bring in other things. It's sort of like that. There was a pre-existing book of Psalms that David wrote, and then they took that and added a bunch of other Psalms and hymns some that David wrote, some that other people <laughs> wrote, they added that to it. Okay? And this is saying, this is where that original set ended. <laughs> okay. So, and we, we, we also talked about in that introduction how depending on which translation you're using, they're numbered different. <laughs> and so, so this is, it's important to remember that Psalms, it becomes real obvious places like this, but all the books of the Old Testament were compiled over time. Right? We say that the first five books were written by Moses, but the language they're written in, the earliest language we have them written in, is a language that didn't exist at the time Moses lived. So Moses wrote something, probably on tablets, right? in a language called Paleo-Hebrew. <laughs> and what we now have right, is, is that translated and edited and put together at a later point. And so all the, all the books of the Old Testament are results of that. So especially the book of Psalms, like I said, it's obvious because it's written by all different people. <laughs> We're going to see the book of Proverbs is the same way. There will be a big chunk of Proverbs by Solomon and then there will be a chunk of Proverbs by somebody else and then some more from Solomon and then... <laughs> something from somebody else that were pre-existing pieces that all kind of got compiled into one one big book. I don't know if I can communicate this properly. It's more of a question of the sin and forgiveness of theology. If you, if you think about David, Saul is, is an example. Saul is that David goes over to the Philistines, returns much of brother booty to them that he has taken. He also murders servants carry him. He continuously lives a lot as long as he's with the Philistines. Okay. Well depending, depending. Well depending, depending. On whether you're reading Second Samuel or whether you're reading Chronicles. Remember Chronicles says he didn't kill anybody but he's with the Philistines. Yeah, yeah well, it's, it's, it's very, very confusing. Yeah. Because the my question is David, as he writes these songs, seems to be continuously in repentance. Yeah. I'm sorry for what I did. But then can we say that his life is a continuous wheel of sin and forgiveness, sin and forgiveness, or I repent because yeah. there's blood on my hands, so I can't build the yeah. temple, but I'll get everything we need for it. Right, well and that's and, and that's what like How does we, that we, translate to our life? When we talk about David and Solomon, it's going back to what we said before. What's the real difference between David and Solomon? Solomon was a sinner and David wasn't. David was Solomon had a bunch of wives and David didn't. David had a bunch of wives. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, all the things that Solomon did that he was judged for, David pretty much did too. Right? The difference is we don't see anywhere where Solomon ever repents. He never 
or ask God to forgive we don't, At least we, we're not shown it. We're not shown anywhere where Solomon says, you know what, I've been way off this whole time. <laughs> right? Whereas we see that with David over and over again. We see over and over again David trying to find forgiveness. Right? Over and over again David's repenting. Whereas Solomon seems, as far as, I, as far as we can tell, now, we're going to get to the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> so, in terms of whether Solomon ever repents, we'll talk about that more when we get to the book of Ecclesiastes. But what we've read about the life of Solomon so far, the way it's set up in the book of, of uh, 2 Samuel and 1 Kings, the way it's set up is to see David as good, at least repent. And Solomon as the example of a bad king who brings about the destruction of the kingdom through his sin. That's how they're depicted there. So Solomon had all this wisdom that didn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Solomon asked, and remember we talked about even, even that story when Solomon asked for wisdom. Right? Remember the wording. He asked God for the knowledge of good and evil. <laughs> That's what he actually asked God for. So that was, was a deliberate hearkening back in terms of what kind of wisdom he wanted. <laughs> and sort of where it, where it got him. At this period in time, there wasn't a written language, was there? It was just a story being told from one are we talking about David's time? Yeah. Back, and even before David. David's time, there was a written language. Was there? Yeah. But before that, it was all spoken, right? Well, they had, they had sort of like, with, with Moses, they had what's called Paleo Hebrew, which was sort of like the equivalent of shorthand. It wasn't a very, it's, it's a written language, but it's not an expressive written language in the sense that they didn't have a lot of conceptual words like peace <laughs> you, know, or, you know they had it was like numbers and cow sheep goat <laughs> you know for making lists you know that kind of thing very basic kind of thing but yeah th these stories were passed down primarily oral and then they were compiled in written form much later and we saw that especially with like the book of Job the book of Job which takes place around 2000 BC but it was clearly written much later than that, actually written down, the version we have now. You know, so that was one that was clearly orally. But yeah, that was the primary way that these stories were transmitted and told. And so it's it's the what we're what we're getting, we're not getting like in those historical books, we're not getting the uh, Walter Cronkite reporting on the events of Solomon's reign <laughs> you know with a film crew out there watching things happening what we're getting is the collective memory we're getting how the people how the people of Israel and we believe because we believe the scriptures are inspired how God remembers Solomon how God and the people of Israel remember David and that's why for example, I had to say, well, are you talking about Chronicles or are you talking about Kings? Because Chronicles has sort of a... It re, is, is written later and in retrospect looks at David much more fondly than, than the book of Samuel does. The book of Samuel, written closer to the time, is more aware of some of the warts and some of the things David did that you would be less than proud of. But after the exile... Once they're in exile in Babylon and they're looking back, David was, you know, a golden age. Would that we could have a king like David again. So yeah, that's that's a piece. That's and that's part of the it's hard for us as modern people. Because we look at something like we look at First Kings and Chronicles and something like that doesn't match. And we want it to match. We're like, well, what really happened? What you know, this is this is going to become important when we get to the Gospels here in a couple of years, when, when we're going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they describe the same event, but the little details are all different. And we, as modern people, want to go, yeah, but what? 
what actually, you know, was there one angel or two angels? Was he inside the tomb? Was he outside the tomb? <laughs> was he on top of the tomb? Right? And we can't wrap our head around that that's not what God gave us. <laughs> Whether we like it or not, what God gave us was four Gospels that have those different details that are all trying, they're all telling us the same story, but they're all trying to make slightly different points, usually. They all remember it slightly differently, and they can all be true. And oftentimes, four people who witness the same event will not report the same way. Right. If they do report it the same way, then it's pretty much guaranteed to be fiction. Right. <laughs> Because it's how we remember. That is true. If you ask a police officer, if you ask a police officer, if they go and interview four people who say they saw something, and they all four tell the exact same story, they conclude that all four of them got together and made up a lie. Because that's the only way that it would be exactly the same. Right? And St. John Chrysostom actually said that about the Gospels. <laughs> He said that the fact that there are little differences in the Gospels is what proves that they're true. It shows that they didn't get together and collude and fabricate a story. But they were all putting their own memories. Well, and that's why it slightly disagrees. None of the apostles knew how to read or write because of the poor people, right? Most of them. Matthew was a tax collector. Well, he knew how to write. Yeah. So, and... and uh, hmm? Right, and Luke wasn't one of the disciples. He was, he was one of the seventy. He wasn't one of the twelve. But he was, he was a physician. He was a follower of St. Paul. Oh yeah. Yeah. And John Mark was a follower of Peter's, and he was basically writing down Peter's remembrances. So, but yeah, a lot of them. In fact, if you, if when we get into the New Testament here in a couple of years, you'll notice that just about every book of the New Testament it tells you who wrote it. One of those trick questions. You ask somebody who wrote Romans, and everybody says St. Paul. And then you look at the page where it kind of scribes the name Lavinius. <laughs> you say, no, see, Lavinius wrote it. <laughs> because St. Paul had somebody taking his dictation. St. Peter, that, well, that's a couple years down the road. We get to first and second Peter, we'll talk about that. <laughs> okay, any other questions on? This one before we move on? Okay. So Psalm 72, Orthodox Study Bible, 73 otherwise. How good God is to Israel, to the upright in heart. But as for me, my feet were almost shaken. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was jealous of the lawless when I beheld the peace of sinners. For there is no upward gaze at their death, nor steadfastness in their chastening. They are not in difficulties as other men, and they shall not be chastened with other men. For this reason, arrogance mastered them. They clothed themselves with their wrongdoing and ungodliness. Their wrongdoing shall go forth as from fatness. They passed through to their heart's intent. They thought and spoke in evil. They spoke in wrongdoing to the height. They set their mouth against heaven and their tongue passed through the earth. For this reason, my people shall return here. Days of fullness shall be found in them. They said, how does God know? Is there knowledge of the Most High? Behold, these are sinners and they prosper. They possess wealth in this age. And I said, Surely in vain have I kept my heart righteous and washed my hands with the innocent. For all day long I was scourged and my reproof persisted through the night. If I should speak, I would describe it thus. Behold, I am breaking covenant with the generation of your children. And I sought to understand this. It was difficult in my sight. Until I came into God's holy place and understood their end. Surely for their deceits you appointed deceits for them. You cast them down in their exaltation. Oh, how they came into desolation suddenly. They ceased to be, they perished in their lawlessness. Like a dream to one who is awakened, so, O Lord, you shall despise their image in your city. For my heart was kindled and my reins were changed, and I was despised and did not know. I became like a beast before you. Now I am continually with you, you hold fast my right hand. With your counsel you guide me, and with glory you take hold of me. For what is there in heaven for me but you, and what do I desire on earth besides you? My heart and my flesh fail, O God of my heart, and God is my portion forever. For behold, those who keep themselves far away from you shall perish. You destroy away from you all who act unfaithfully. But as for me, it is good to cling to God, to put my hope in the Lord, that I may proclaim all your praises in the gates of the daughter of Zion. Okay, so what is this saying? Well, it starts out, I almost slipped. Right? I almost blew it. Why? 
Well, because the, the psalmist is saying, I went and I looked at all these people who are going out and who are living sinfully, who are doing these wicked things, right? Who are, who are living these wicked lives, doing all these things that I, you know, I'm trying to keep the ways of God. I'm trying to follow God's commandments. I'm trying to live the right way. But I looked over at them and I saw that they seemed happy. They seemed to be having a great time, right? I had, I had troubles. I had sufferings I was going through. They didn't seem to have any, right? They didn't seem to not have a care in the world, right? And so what? I got jealous. I was like, why am I bothering? Why am I? De-? They're perfectly happy. They're enjoying their life more than I am. I should just go and be like them, right? That's how he, that's how he almost slips, okay? That's how he almost slips. We've talked about this, this theme before in the Psalms, right? This idea that, that what was the difference between Israel and the other nations? The other nations, right, like the Canaanites, God would say their iniquities, the cup of their iniquities has gotten full, right? They've reached the boiling point. Now I'm going to wipe them off the face of the earth, right? Now judgment's going to come upon them, Right? You just let them go and let them go and let them go and they'd sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and sin and sin. It would reach a certain point and you'd wipe them out. Whereas with Israel, Israel would just start to sin and God would smack them. Right? <laughs> that was the difference. Right? Israel would start to sin. He didn't wait for it to get to that point and wipe them off the face of the earth. As soon as they started going the wrong way, he stepped in and disciplined them. Right? And then brought them back and restored them when they repented. That's what's being described here on a personal level. Right? We talked about how St. Paul refers to this. You know, God disciplines every son whom he loves. Okay? So the same way with people. Right? The psalmist is one of God's people. And so he's got all this chastening going on in his life. Right? Where God's bringing him to repentance. God's making him confront things in his life. It's not pleasant, right? It's not enjoyable trying to deal with the sin in your life. It's not as fun, right? Whereas these other people, he's just letting them go, letting them go, letting them go. What causes him to finally not slip? Well, he sees what happens to those people in the end, right? He sees what the end result of God just letting them go their own way is. They end up in destruction. Right? There is no upward gaze. <laughs> Where's that? Verse 4. Yeah. There is no upward gaze at the death. Yeah. Right. There's service that are chasing because they are, not, they are not in difficulties. Oh, what does that mean, no upward gaze at their death? They don't look to their death. It means they seem to go to it peacefully. Oh. Seem to be. Right, like he says, they have riches in this age. <laughs> right, everything seems good for them now. But he sees where the ultimate, the ultimate end of that is. And I've probably referred to this before, but it reminds me, there was an episode of an old TV show, long ago canceled, where there were these, these four demons at a coffee shop, talking shop, <laughs> about how they trick these people. Right, and so... You know, the first one tells this big, long story about how he got this guy to go and do all these evil things. This other one tells a story about how he got this man to destroy his family and ended up committing suicide. And so they go to the third guy. And the third guy tells this story. And he says, well, there was this guy I was assigned to. And basically, I just left him alone. And he got up every morning and went to work and came back home and watched some TV and went to sleep. Did that for about 30 years. I'm hard with that. And the other demons are like, that's the dumbest story I've ever heard. And the other demon looks back at him and says, well, he went to hell. <laughs> Mission accomplished, right? <laughs> Without him having to break a sweat. <laughs> right? This is that idea. <laughs> just, least, just left alone. <laughs> Go their own way, do their own thing, and it ends in destruction. Right? So this is this is another thing for us to reorient our focus, right? Because 
our picture of life is if somebody's happy and successful and wealthy, we look at them and say, wow, they must be doing something right. Right? And if someone's suffering and sick and <laughs> facing hardships, we say, wow, they must have messed up somewhere. <laughs> See, in this case, what, what this is saying to us again is that when we really understand the world from God's perspective, the opposite is true. Often it's the people who are suffering and the people who are struggling at any given point in time who are on the right path and going where they need to go. And the people who seem to be real well off and having a ball are on the way to their own destruction. And so we need to reorient our, reorient our perspective. And then again, uh, as we see before, verse 27... So you talk about the wrath of God, right? And we talked about this before in terms of, in terms of the, our orthodox understanding of, of what hell is, right? And we talked about how you know, everyone who goes to hell chooses to go there, right? We see an example of that here at the beginning of verse 27. For behold, those who keep themselves far away from you shall perish, right? How do they end up perishing? <laughs> they keep themselves far away from God. But then, the parallel verse, you destroy away from you all who act unfaithfully. So these two things go together. When we talk about God's wrath, and we talk about people choosing to stay away from God, we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same thing. When we get into St. Paul, we're going to talk about the big theological word for it is synergy. The idea that in our salvation... Right? We cooperate with God. Right? We don't save ourselves. God doesn't save us against our will. Right? We cooperate. Right? God saves us and we choose to cooperate with God. Well, the same is true on the negative side. The same is true on the negative side. That people who choose to remove themselves from God, who choose to reject God, are also rejected by God. But those are the flip side of the same coin. Okay. You don't have someone who really loves God and wants to draw close to them and wants to be saved, but doesn't make the cut. Right? And you don't have someone who hates God, doesn't care about his commandments, but gets saved anyway. Because <laughs> God just picked them. Right? That, that doesn't occur. Right? What we do and what God does in our lives go hand in hand. Does that make sense? So what you, sounds like what you're saying just throws that predestination thing that the Calvinists used right out the window. Yeah, that's what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was doing. She, she said that throws the whole idea of predestination that Calvinists believe out the window. And I said, yeah, that's what I was doing. <laughs> throw it out the window. Well, or or understanding it differently, right? That 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 it includes our cooperation. It throws it throws yeah the Calvinist type of predestination out the window. But again, someone who chooses to reject God is rejected by God. Someone chooses who cooperates, chooses to cooperate and love God is chosen by God. So you can use those terms, right? But either the, the, you don't get the opposites. You don't get someone who loves God, but God hates him. <laughs> you, don't get, you don't get someone who hates God, but God, you know, saves them anyway. <laughs> against their will. Does that mean my atheist friend is pretty much doomed? <laughs> it depends. I don't know him well enough to judge him. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's that's God's job, not mine. But uh, that's your not your pay grade. Yeah, leave it leave it above my pay grade. Yeah, <laughs> leave it to him. So I yeah I I hope for my sake that God's going to err on the side of mercy. <laughs> but. Uh, 
the one who said he would do his father's will versus the one that actually did it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can I get through one more? I'm going to do one more. Okay. Psalm 73, Orthodox Study Bible 74, otherwise. O oh God, why have you rejected us to the end? Why is your anger raged against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation you acquired from the beginning, that you redeemed the rod of your inheritance, this Mount Zion where you encamped. Lift up your hands against their arrogance to the end, against everything the enemy prostituted in your holy places. Those who hate you boasted in the midst of your feast. They set up their signs, yes, signs, and they did not know. As into an entrance hall, as in a thicket of trees, they cut down its doors with axes. With battle axes and hammers, they broke it down. They burned down your sanctuary. They defiled the tabernacle of your name to the ground. Their kindred said in their heart together, Come, let us abolish all the feasts of God from the earth. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, and he will no longer know us. How long, O God, will the enemy reproach? Will the adversary provoke your name to the end? Why do you turn away your hand, your right hand, from the midst of your breast to the end? But God is our king before the ages. He works salvation in the midst of the earth. You strengthened the sea by your power. You crushed the heads of dragons upon the water. You shattered the heads of the dragon. You gave him as food for the Ethiopian peoples. You broke apart fountains and torrents. You dried up the rivers of Etham. The day is yours and the night is yours. You created the light and the sun. You made all the boundaries of the earth. Summer and winter you formed these things. Remember this, the enemy insulted the Lord and a foolish people provoked your name. May you not deliver to wild beasts the soul who gives thanks to you. May you not forget the souls of your poor to the end. Look upon your covenant, for the dark places of the earth are filled with the houses of lawlessness. Let not the humbled and the disgraced be turned away. The poor and needy shall praise your name. Rise, O God, judge your cause. Remember the insults against you by the foolish man all the day long. Do not forget the voice of your suppliants. The arrogance of those who hate you rises against you continually. There's a reason why I wanted to do this one more. <laughs> and it's because verse uh, 12, which is sort of the pivot point here in the middle of the psalm, verse 12 is uh, the uh, prokimenon for uh, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, which is Saturday. God is our king before the ages. He has worked salvation in the midst of the earth. But let's back up before that. The verses before that are sort of the first part of the psalm is primarily talking about what? The destruction of the temple, right? Talking about the, the enemies having invaded, having broke down the doors, having knocked down the, the building. You notice what's interesting, though? They're talking about the temple, right? Do they ever use the word temple? They keep referring to the tabernacle. Did the tabernacle ever sit on Mount Zion? No. <laughs> the tabernacle never sat there. Remember what we said about the temple. God didn't give instructions for the temple. He gave instructions for the tabernacle. Right? So this psalm in appealing to God, what's it appealing to God to do? It's saying, how long are you going to put up with this? <laughs> right? And what does it say they tried to do? Destroy the tabernacle and abolish the feasts. Because remember, back in Deuteronomy, what did God command in terms of his worship? He didn't talk about a temple. He gave him instructions for the tabernacle, and he said, here are the sacrifices and the feasts, Passover, Pentecost, all the other feasts they were to celebrate. Right? So they're saying, God, look, <laughs> they've come here, they've destroyed these things, they've stopped us from worshiping you the way you asked us to. How long are you going to tolerate that? Okay, that's, that's the problem that we get set up in the first half. Okay. That's the problem. Because of their invasion, we can't worship God the way he's commanded us to. So now that 12, verse 12 begins with that but. That but. So now we're going to talk about the solution to the problem. The way God's going to solve that problem. And it starts with that verse that we use on the Feast of the Cross. God is our king before the ages. He has worked salvation or has wrought salvation in the midst of the earth. And in the midst of is actually in the middle. Now this will seem weird to us because we of course think of the world as a sphere. <laughs> so if you had the middle of the earth, it would be somewhere in the core of the planet surrounded by lava, right? Magma. Okay, that's not what they're referring to. 
their picture of the world, remember, is you have the ends of the earth. I won't draw the whole picture again. But <laughs> it's flat, supported by pillars, right? Dead smack in the center, according to Jewish belief, is Jerusalem. Jerusalem, okay? Because going all the way back to Genesis, where did God put Eden? In the midst of the earth. Creates the earth, and in the midst of it, creates a garden. Okay. Right in the middle. Adam and Eve get cast out of the garden. They die, they, they're buried, right? According to Jewish tradition, they're buried in a hill. Adam, in particular, is buried in a hill. Okay. Near Eden. Cast out, they can't go back in. He's buried in this hill. The promised land, then, in terms of their understanding, God's not just bringing them to some strip of land he picked at random. Right? He's bringing them to a land flowing with milk and honey. Right? From their perspective, what's he doing? He's bringing them back to paradise, back to Eden. Right? He's fixing what was wrong, went wrong with them being cast out. And you know, so then they get exiled again. But so their understanding is that this area around Jerusalem is where Eden was. Now if you've seen the orthodox icon of the crucifixion, you may have noticed that under the cross, right, it's on the hill of the skull. Right, Golgotha, the place of the skull. There's a little skull and sometimes some bones in a little black area, like under the hill of the cross. That is because the reason that hill was called the place of the skull, that hill outside the city walls of Jerusalem, is because that is the place where they believed Adam was buried. Okay. That is the place they believed Adam was buried. That's the place where Jesus is then crucified. And so that's why that is in the icon. Okay. So... This, the traditions that this is pointing to, God's rod salvation in the midst of the earth is pointing to the place where Jesus was crucified. Right in the middle of the world. Right, right in the midst of the earth. And to this day, the, the Greek name for, for the church within the church of the Holy Sepulchre, right, in Jerusalem, the church of the Holy Sepulchre covers... It's built over the place where Christ was crucified, where he was buried, where they prepared the body. All those sites are within. But the central church, central Orthodox church where they celebrate the liturgy there most of the time, the Greek name for it literally means the navel of the world. That it's the, the middle. So that's where this idea of he has wrought salvation in the midst of the earth comes from. So our problem is Mount Zion we can't worship you there anymore we can't celebrate the feast anymore God's solution to that is Christ right? Christ is crucifixion so that now God can be worshipped again in the way that he should be namely in Christ and of course verse 22 we see what we see a lot in the Psalms. Arise, O God. This reference to rising again. This reference to literally waking up and getting up. Which we know God doesn't sleep. Right. Now the last thing to note in this Psalm is there's this, there's this chunk here between verse 13 to verse 17. Right. And this is, this chunk is very old. We don't know how old. But this chunk is making references, is making reference to Canaanite mythology. Because you look at it and you go, what's all this about? You strengthen the sea by your you crush the heads of dragons on the water. What am I talking about? I don't remember that. Okay. We talked about way back when we were in Genesis that the Canaanite view of creation, the Babylonian view of creation where the sea and the, the, the Hebraic word for that is Yom Yom they thought was a monster 
sometimes a dragon, sometimes some other type of monster. All right, because the sea, big, scary, lots of people die in it. Right? Storms come off of it. Right? And, and so the, the most of the creation myths of the Canaanites have something to do with whoever their god is coming and fighting Yah, coming and fighting the sea and beating it. Okay. That's what this is referring to when it talks about crushing the heads of dragon upon the water, shattering the heads of the dragon. Right? This is talking, and then that's put in the context of creation, verse 16, the day is yours, the night is yours, you created the light and the sun, you set the boundaries of the earth. That's why this is connected to, to creation. Well, why would you refer to that here? Why are we all of a sudden referencing referencing well, mythology? Well, in the the other dragon is usually the sky. If you're in Babylonian mythology, which is relevant here, since this is after the exile, right? The Babylonians have destroyed the temple. Babylonian mythology. There's a dragon named Tiamat that's the sky, and there's a dragon named Baphomet that's the sea. And the world was created when the two of them fornicated. And then humanity was created when the Babylonian god Marduk came and killed, killed both of them and threw their blood on the ground. Well, I thought we just the Ethiopian people <laughs> for the food. Is this where this myth came from? No. No, it's a Babylonian. It's a Babylonian myth. Okay. But the the idea here is that is that we're, we're some of their context. Our problem is the Babylonians who worship Marduk have come in and wiped out the temple, wiped out our ability to worship our God. From a Babylonian perspective, what does that mean? From a Babylonian perspective, that means Marduk and Yahweh had a fight and Marduk won. Yeah. Yeah. This is, so this is saying, no. <laughs> this is saying, no. It isn't Marduk who did any of this stuff. All right. It's Yahweh who created the world. It's Yahweh who conquers the sky and the sea. Right, and destroys them. And it's Yahweh, who is going to bring salvation in the midst of the earth for his people. So it's countering the Babylonian view. Yeah, well, that's confusing to me because he's very specific here about the Ethiopian people. Yeah. And Edmund. Okay, so you're looking at a destination and a place. Now, the Ethiopians, as we, as we know, and the Book of Enoch, which is a very spiritual and very revealing right. type of book. Okay? But then we look also that the waters, the rivers, dried up. Yeah. Is he talking close to the Garden of Eden? And then? No. no. No, this is referring to the the the, uh, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, all believe that the Ethiopians are the oldest people on earth. Okay. Followed by the Egyptians. The Egyptians are the oldest. Followed by. So this is talking about, so remember in the Babylonian myth, Marduk kills these things and throws their blood on the ground and their blood becomes human beings. Okay. Right? That's being juxtaposed with, with God conquers these things and gives them to people for food. People who be created. Would dry up the river, any river, mean God, a powerful Yes, that's what it's trying to say. That it's that it's God who created all these things. It's God who is controls all these things and has and has power over all these things. And that's why God is going to be able to save them. Because it's not that Marduk beat their God. Right. That's what they're that's what they're countering the Babylonian idea. This means that the Babylonian God is better than their God. It's really their God. Now this, this part about the dragons having their heads crushed and all this in the sea is actually quoted in our services for the Feast of Theophany. When Christ is baptized. 
Right? And if you notice in the icon of Christ's baptism, under his feet, there's the symbol of the cross, and under that there are snakes. Over their heads up, and you're like, what's with the water snakes? Right? That's, referring, that's referring to this image. Right? And we talk about how, in those homes, how there's these poetic references to God having conquered the Jordan and the snakes who dwell therein. <laughs> That's not literal. Those are these mythological references to the Canaanite peoples who worshipped the river and believed the river was a god. Is this also and who thought the sea was a god and who worshipped these other gods. That it's, that it's God who created all these things and controls all these things and has power over all these things. Uh, is this related to St. George? No, that's different. <laughs> We'll get to that. We'll get to that dragon when we get to Revelation. Uh, <laughs> a year or two down the road. Yeah, a couple years from now when we get to Revelation. Okay. Does anybody have any other questions about that? That one gets a little weird. <laughs> but that's what it's referring. It's referring to that mythological idea. He's attacking the way the Babylonians look at it. He's saying, "You think you and your God won? You didn't. <laughs> right? You don't get what's happening." Okay. Okay, so that's it for tonight. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. We'll continue next week. We got through what six or seven. <laughs> so we're about halfway through Psalms. <laughs>